Let's all go DDoS FedEx. That will delay my stuff even more. Unless I, I, I was kind of thinking, like, I have three light packages from them now, and it's like they're just perpetually holding all my stuff hostage. So, um, yeah, we're not going to give fantastic. in. Terms. We don't negotiate with terrorists here. Yeah, it's, it's very much like, here's our new business model. We're just going to keep your stuff now. <laughs> so, it's great. I think we're just waiting to put it all in the same, like, box or shipment, put them all together. I mean, that would be cool if they were actually doing that, except that's not what they're doing. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, so let's talk about, um, let's, let's talk about this mid stack stuff again. We've been here before. Uh, we're coming back to it now. So, um, as we kind of have established already, JavaScript is the principal language that kind of governs everything that we've done so far. Um, and that is true even in our Mern stack, whenever we add in React. Um, so this, like the idea of JavaScript is going to follow us again through this entire unit. It's going to be both our front end with React and also our back end with our, uh, with the rest of our Mern stack, uh, to create our Mern stack. So. Uh, just as a reminder, Node is going to be the runtime environment that our server, our backend server, is actually going to be using. Uh, Express is going to be the framework that we are running inside of this Node environment, uh, and it's going to manage that request response cycle for us. That's the job of Express. Uh, and this time, instead of having EJS here, uh, we are not going to have that at all. Uh, we are only going to have um, the, uh, if we look in here, we are not going to be using EJS anymore. We are crossing that off of our list. Say farewell. No more EJS. What's replacing EJS? React. Yes, React. React is what we will be using to do all of our views instead. Uh, so that is going to be running on our client device. Um, you'll remember last time, where was this EJS running? Where was our EJS being executed? Where were we compiling this? In the database, MongoDB. Mm, it was using the data from the database. So close, but looking for something a little bit more specific. We were writing it right on our HTML files. Okay, cool. Yes. And where were those, where were we taking the data from the database? We were combining it with those HTML files. And then where, where was that action taking place? Views. Views, yes, yes. I'm I'm looking for a device, a specific device where that was happening on. Was that happening on the client or the server? That was on the server. It was on the server, yes. All of our EJS being compiled all of that happened server side. And what our server was responsible for was building all of that out and then sending the fully uh, rendered HTML to our client. This is going to be a little bit different whenever we're using the min stack, uh, the uh, node and express and MongoDB in our backend. Now, because what all of these things are going to be responsible for is just getting data and then sending that raw data to our front end, to our client's device. And then the client is going to be building the rendered HTML on their machine. So before in unit two, we were doing server-side rendering. 
all of that was happening server side. We were compiling, we're using the data from the database and we were combining that with our actual views. And then once we had all of that data and the views all together, we were sending a fully rendered HTML document to the client. What we're doing now in this unit is we're sending raw data to the client. And then the client is going to build out all of this stuff on the client device on their end. We're using their machine to do this work instead of ours. And we're still going to be using uh, MongoDB and Mongoose to be able to uh, implement all of this stuff. Again, MongoDB is going to persist our data. It's document-based instead of uh, being a relational database. And then Mongoose is going to allow our JavaScript application to actually talk to MongoDB. And we're going to still define uh, schemas in there, and those schemas are going to define the shape of our data. We're still going to be using .env and a .env file to do all of this stuff. So remember, this is the view from our MinStack applications. Our clients down here were making requests over to our server. The server was then handling those requests and how it does. And this view over here was happening on the server side. What we're going to be doing in React is a little bit different from this because we don't have these anymore in our React applications. We have no views on our server side. We will have routers, we'll have controllers, we'll have a model, and we'll have MongoDB. All of that is still here. And this is what our backend is going to be doing now. Instead of sending a fully rendered HTTP response, what this is going to be doing is sending back JSON data. That's also going to film uh, be the actual request as well. So instead of sending fully rendered HTML back and forth, this is now going to be JSON data that we use instead to talk from our client and to reply to our client. So we'll build out a more complete view of this here uh, a little bit later, but just to kind of put what we're talking about today into perspective, this is kind of where we're going to start. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah. So does anyone have questions about this? Before we move on. Fantastic. Okay. Wait, one one thing. Yeah, if, yeah, yeah. If you're putting React on this, it would be where the client's computer is. Yes, there. exactly. That's... Yep, so this is React. React app. All right, so um, let's go ahead and uh, let me stop sharing over there. And instead, I'm gonna share over here. So Uh, what we're going to do now is talk about how we're actually going to be using uh, our min stack in uh, relation to our uh, React applications. So the job of our backend is going to be to expose an API. 
that is all that our backend is going to be doing right now. Um, and it's that API is going to talk to our database. It's going to be sending and re uh, receiving requests and responding to requests. It's going to be doing all of that stuff. But that is the job of our backend now. It is no longer to render views. It's no longer to have any HTML inside of it. Uh, it is just solely going to be responsible for uh, sending and respond or receiving and responding to requests from our client and getting data from a database. Uh, Seb, you had a question. So is the R in MERN stack React or have I just lost the plot? Nope, it totally is. The R in MERN stack is React. 100%. And again, today we're going to focus on the min part of this. Tomorrow we'll add back in React. All right. So what is the job of this API going to be in our backend? Well, it is going to essentially be able to uh, respond to our client requests. It's going to ensure that we can build out our React application without having to uh, commit to full page refreshes like we were doing before uh, with all of the apps that we've built so far. Uh, and then uh, it's also going to allow us uh, to kind of be front end agnostic. Uh, our backend is going to kind of just be written. It's going to interact with the database. It's going to respond to a front end with JSON data. We don't necessarily have to use React with the backend that we're building. We could use something like Angular. We could use a, uh, we could build mobile apps. We could do all kinds of different things with the backends that we're going to be creating. Uh, because the backend is not just going to be rendering HTML but instead it's going to be sending back JSON data to our client devices. So the front end that we're using here actually doesn't really, uh, it, it's kind of independent of the rest of the work that we're going to be doing in the back end. Any kind of application could hit up these endpoints that we're going to expose on the back end uh, to be able to get data. All right, so. Um, also, as I've said multiple times now, we are not going to have any views. At least on our back end, uh, the front end will still have those. Um, we'll still have, you know, all of the react, uh, information up there, but we won't be ex like writing HTML views in a back end, like we did in unit two. So um, what we're going to start all of this with is actually having you all go and kind of re-familiarize re yourself with uh, these actual uh, min stack applications. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, setup that you all have not done for a little while. Uh, there's kind of, a, you know, you'll have to mess with routes. You'll have to kind of dig into this a little bit. I highly, 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 highly recommend that you pull up a unit two application uh, that you can reference as you are uh, going and building out uh, a new, uh, the new application that we are going to be uh, building today. Uh, so I would pull one of those up right now. Um, I am going to give uh, you all about 30 minutes here in some groups. Uh, for you to uh, break out and uh, you're going to be building these uh, kind of the starting point of this application together. Then we'll re-meet uh, and we'll kind of go through this, make sure we're all on the same page before we move on. And uh, then that is kind of where we'll kick our day off with, uh, with actually building all this out. So let me throw you all in your groups real quick. While I'm setting this up, does anybody have any questions?
anybody at all. So would mongoose flights be like a good thing to reference here? Uh, yeah, that'd be perfect, actually. That would be perfect. Um, let's see. Anybody else have any questions? Uh, make sure in these groups that you're kind of, you know, getting together or talking to each other, uh, kind of setting this up all kind of alongside one another. Uh, make sure you're moving through it. Everybody's kind of on the same page. Like I said, whenever we get back uh, together, we'll kind of go over this as a group so uh, that we're all on the same page before we actually move on with our day. Uh, make sure that you know, there's no confusion and you all can ask any questions that you might have. Again, it's been a hot minute since we've done any of this. It's going to be 100% cool if you're a little like shaky on some of this stuff and you're like, wait, what do I do now? Uh, why do I do this? That is super, super normal. Um, but I do want you to kind of get some hands-on time with one another. Uh, into these actual express applications without me like hand holding you through the entire thing uh of course you know we will kind of make sure that we're all good before we move on but all right almost have groups set up anybody have any questions last chance very good Again, I'm going to give you 30 minutes for this. Uh, I am going to have a Slack thread. If all of you, if you could hit an emoji on there whenever you wrap up um, with all of this, that would be fantastic. Just so if all of you are done like 20 minutes into this, that we aren't just sitting around doing nothing for uh, half an hour. So uh, rooms are opening. Y'all have fun. Ooh. yeah yeah scotty is gonna right. scotty's gonna avenge christ and be on the engineering channel just taking care of everyone right scotty i'm gonna get his ass kicked just provoke him i'll be wearing my instructor t-shirt yes yes what's uh, up your new class correctly what'd you say hunter what's that song at the end of the breakfast club when he when he does this don't you don't forget you about me yeah forget yeah. about me we're gonna play that on your on graduation day yeah oh dude that sounds great please put that down on ben's paper so we don't forget followed by i will remember you by sarah mclaughlin i will remember you now, is that a raccoon or a cat <laughs> it does like look like a raccoon he is a lot like a raccoon oh my I... god fat tabby I know the one song I can't listen to is How Far We've Come by Matchbox 20 because that is the most yes. wonderful song there is. But man, that shit hits different. Boy, howdy. I'm going down the rabbit hole. Follow that up the by song, uh, Run for Cover by the Killers and I am on the floor. The song Freshman. Um, by the Verb Pipe. I couldn't think of their name. The freshman, that song, I can't. Let's not even get into Kings of Leon because then I'm dead. How quickly after we graduate do you all start your giant cohort? Uh, that one is, it's launching on the 24th of January. So it'll be like a legit month off, which is kind of wild. I don't think. I've never had a month off, so. 
what are you going to do with your life? You just going to hang out at Ben's? No. Um, yeah. He'll be on the engineering channel. Yeah. That's so and true. Waiting. He'll be sitting on the Zoom. <laughs> we're just shooting, just firing shots at David. <laughs> Jeez. I, I mean, it's fine. Volleyball on a stick going Wilson? Wilson? We have some really cool plans for the curriculum and like adding some like new content. It's, it's going to be awesome. If anyone wants to test it out, let us know. Well, yeah, I want to some see of us might have some us. extra time. I want to test it out if you're being serious. I, yeah, honestly, that would be really helpful. Yep. I love how Scotty's always wrapped up. OC season. You've been like this since the end of summer, dude. OC boy all day, every day. He's going to turn into a beautiful butterfly by the end of the winter. Oh my God. Oh, little Scotty butterfly. That'll be fun. That's his new nickname, Scotty Butterfly. <laughs> it sounds beautiful and tough at the same time. It does. That's why it's fitting. It's Scotty mm-hmm. Chrysalis still, though, right? What'd you say? Is it Chrysalis? Right now, he's just a, Scotty right now he's just a Scotty pupa, but he pupa. will graduate into yep. a Scotty <laughs> Butterfly. It sounds like the name for like a 1950s like street tough in West Side Story. Yeah, he's like a beautiful, dangerous man. I am so excited for Spielberg's West Side Story. The previews look just like the old one. Yeah, but they actually used Latino actors. Did Bernstein not in his original? They're all white people. Yeah, that was oh, back in the day when like John Wayne was playing Genghis Khan, so. Yeah. <laughs> then I'm looking forward to the Spielberg version. I love West Side Story. Plus, I just like Spielberg. I like his um, dramatics and over the topness. Very emotional filmmaking. Yeah, he, yeah. I'm, I'm, I just love West Side Story. I'll love both versions, I'm sure. I love Romeo and Juliet and Shakespeare, so. You looking forward to um, Joel Cohen's um, Shakespeare bit he's doing? Is he doing Macbeth with um, Denzel Washington? Whoa. Oh, yeah. I didn't even know that. They're doing mm-hmm. Macbeth? I did not know that. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's Denzel. so exciting. Oh, that's going to... Denzel Washington as Macbeth? Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Corey Hawkins as Macduff. This is going to be so good. Why did I not know this was happening? I think it's because it's going to be minimal, minim, minimalistic. People don't really get into that kind of stuff. Oh, I think Blogtown was like the last one they did kind of that style. That's amazing. Hamlet's my favorite, but Macbeth is pretty close second. Yeah. Hey, I, I just wanted to add to the um, job searching anxiety that was shared earlier. Uh, you want to start having some good manager managing your expectations right now. You will get rejected. It's just part of the game. If you don't get rejected and get the first shot, that's pretty great. But also it could be red flag because the company doesn't, you know, it could be insane stuff. So just know that it's okay that you can get 10, 15, 20 rejections, but that should not shake your moral compass or your sort of like knowledge base. You should feel pretty strong because you've gotten through this crazy program, right? Um, now, you're going to apply for roles maybe and let's say they're junior roles or they're non-junior roles they're going to have different questions and what i would suggest to you in those situations is do one do it all the snoopiest things you can possibly can right say you know you like one company go reach out to the engineer at that company from linkedin find them talk to them don't even ask them about the job just like yo what's what's it like over there <coughs> worst day you've had all that good stuff so i would it is anxiety causing, you will be refreshing your email inbox a lot, right? To see what, what's going on and you need to follow up and say, hey, what's the status of my application? It's been a month, you haven't told me anything. That's also because you've got, you know, 300 engineers applying for the same job, right? So you're, the, the, the hardest 
part of this career is to get that first job. So you've already done 50% of the hardest part or at the end of this course, you know, given that you completed, and then you're going to have one more hard thing to do, but that thing is not going to be as hard as you think. It's just a very emotional game of interview process because these people are just not communicative. So you're going to have to keep each other in check. Some of the best cohorts still do a morning stand up with each other. Like after the cohort, they'll get together and they'll talk. They'll be like, hey, what's up with you? What's going on with you? So like even outside of your post-course outcomes gatherings that you'll do, create groups amongst yourself. Keep each other accountable. Share jobs with each other. Hey, you're good at this. You should think about this. Like that. if you could do that together, you will all get jobs 10 times faster than if you did it all on your own cold applying to jobs. So that's once you get the job, your job is actually far easier than this course and also the process of the interview, right? So, and again, once you get the job, it's not the end of the world. Most developers will leave their job in the first year and then go to another one, higher pay, et cetera, et cetera. So you should put that in your ratio too. You may not get the most perfect thing, but you'll get your foot in the door. And after that, it's smooth sailing. You have pushed up code, you'll have experience, life is good. So. There's a few things, and I'll, I'll mention more of these uh, as we go forward. I just want you guys to manage your expectations, not because you aren't capable of, of getting the first job. It's just that's how the industry works. There's so many applicants. But the fact that you're building these projects out, your portfolios are stronger than I would say some of the other school graduates that come out. So use those, you know, the, the unit two here is a very, like, it's a pretty complex unit. That's why we're making you this review right now from Mernstack. It's going to be very useful. So this point onwards in this course, like, let's have fun, but let's get serious. Let's, let's say, you know what, I'm going to really sit down. You know, the moneymaker is the stack that you're in right now. The most amount of jobs available are in this stack. So roll your eyes up and, you know, do whatever it is that you do, breathe, walk, jump, scream, whatever it is that you need to do to buck up, have fun, but totally really hone in on this unit and learn the stuff that's going to make you badass. Yes, sir. So my question is for like all the instructors and anyone who's had like any kind of interview experience, the one piece of feedback that I've gotten from my friends who like admittedly got jobs their first jobs like three or four years ago was that during the interview process the most annoying thing was that they were asked questions that like had nothing to do with what they were going to be doing in their day to day has that shifted like i've heard like tangentially that that's shifted somewhat um but yeah is that still like more or less the norm yeah, it, that's that depends on the engineer, senior engineer of the team on what they're trying to test you. Like something may not seem like you're going to actually, I don't know, reverse a link list at your job. They're just looking to see, can you solve a problem, right? Uh, I have interviewed engineers where I have not even given them a code challenge. I've literally given them a puzzle to solve because it felt better for me to gauge somebody's like where they are, not because of how accurately they solve the puzzle it's just that let's take away the code the thing that you may be nervous about and just see which how are you going to solve a problem so I, I make people do a particular puzzle if you guys ever want to do that puzzle let me know um and it's just shows okay this is how this is how i'm working through the problem so you should not don't worry about like oh what kind of question is coming the idea is not to be become some algorithm expert. The idea is to show that you can solve your problem. And so what you want to do for anyone who's been sort of scared, you know, when I call you out or when I say share your screen now, et cetera, et cetera, don't be quiet when you're solving a problem. Always talk through it. Sing a song while you're writing a React component about the React component. Like get yourself in the habit of talking about these things, okay? That's what you want. Because at the interview, you literally have to play the role. Like you gotta say, oh, well, all right, let's put up state now. Like the way I lecture, or one of us, we I talk about all, as I'm typing, I'm talking about, right? Get to that point, because that's what they want. 45 minutes pass, you didn't even solve the problem, but you did that, you'll get the job. Nate. I was also going to add to your point, like I sound like a broken record at this point talking about Jonathan, but like you mentioned reach out to someone, you just need one person mm -hmm. because Becca gave me the question to ask at the end of that informational interview, if you get one person, 
is there anyone else you could recommend in this field I also talk to? Do you have anyone else who might, or who anyone else who might be willing to connect with me on this issue yeah. or this topic? And then boom, you got networking done for you. It's like and a they, pyramid. They may have a blog or a video, YouTube channel that they follow that you don't know about, and they'll be like, "Yo, check this out." You have no like, just one person changes exactly. Good, good point, Nate. Yeah, it's it's in, it's inverse pyramid scheme where you go like through them, through other people, and then through them you go through other people, and then boom, all of a sudden you're done. Truly, yeah. Um, and I'm gonna reiterate one more time: you gotta work together through these applications. You proofread each other's resumes once you're done with that. Keep each other accountable. You know, somebody applies, you didn't get a job. Encourage them. Like it's all right. We're gonna get through this together. Like. Those things, I cannot tell you how much I lack that. I also had a cohort of six people, five people. Well, that was a long time ago. But it's it's like very lonely when you're applying by yourself and getting rejections or like even interviews and you have nobody to bounce off anything with. And so, yeah, sure, Becca can do some and sure you can reach out to us, but having each other is the, going to be the most important thing um, for the solidarity, for the camaraderie, for the moving upwards. And also for the interview, like, I can't tell you how many students come back and say, this is the interview question I got and how do I start, right? Sam, you should talk about, you know, like we're all here to do these things. We love working through these problems. So take homes, come to us, talk to us, all that stuff. If we're available, we're happy to help. Yeah, I've had some really gnarly take home tests uh, over the course of this cohort um, that, uh, every the entire instructional team like sort of helped me out with and like helped me work through and I didn't even um I didn't get those jobs the job that I got um that I'm starting in January didn't even have a technical I just talked through my react code so it's kind of like all over the place but um yeah if you want to hear more about my those technicals that I got, um, I'd be happy to share because I'm actually really proud of them, even though they were not up to par. Share those, please. I have but while you were solving there. those, oops, while you were solving those technicals, did you or did you not learn a ton? So much. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. So it's not even about like, like getting the job. The fact that you interviewed, you got to the technical round, and you just leveled up in life. So like always go. In, apply for a job, interview it, even if you didn't want it, because you might scoop a technical question that's going to level you up. Yeah. And, you know, the places. What were you saying, Kate? I was just going to say I've had friends who's got, who have gone like weeks of interviews and still got rejected. Yeah. Yeah. I've gotten to the end a few times. Um, all you need is one. But, like, the, you know, if you, submit a technical to a place that's like actually has a good culture and like cares about like developer improvement. Um, they'll give you feedback too on your technical and about why it's not up to their standards. And that's, that was super helpful too. Did you ask for feedback directly or did they just share in response? Uh, I've done both. I've asked for feedback. And then some places have just like responded with detailed feedback, which is really generous of them. But it should be the standard, I think, but it's very generous uh, because somebody, you know, had to take the time to like write you a paragraph about like what they would have liked to see differently. I want to touch on something real quick. Um, as you're upskilling, keep on building projects. Our former students, our, our last class, a uh, few students attended like a job fair project presentation thing. And the two students that made a project for that event got a job that week. So uh, keep building things, keep making new projects. It's important. Um, on top of that, how do you say keep building projects? Does it have to be intense, like when we take user input, or could we like tweak it to our own? Like, let's say we want to have a really interactive, responsive blog, but it doesn't require user input, like to log in and then create, update. It could just be like full read-in functionality. 
I, I mean, if, if you if you make a great project with those constraints, like I, I'm sure you can pull that off. Um, but like as as you like learn a new skill, like let's say you look into GraphQL, you want to implement that in a project and show off that skill, and that, or maybe return to old projects from this this course and you know maybe add a React front end to project two, stuff like that. It'll it'll show in potential employers that you're invested in this stuff and you're constantly iterating on previous projects and things like that. It's gonna snow today and I'm excited. I know that was off topic, but. Off topic is just are... what I need to jump in. Go ahead, Ollie, you can get the last word on this. <laughs> I was just gonna say, I was looking up on Google right now. I just surprised that um, React is the most used framework out of everything. I was tried to they the guy that recruit not recruited me the like admissions people they tried to talk me out of taking being in this cohort. By the way, they were like, "You should do Ruby on Rails because it's more in the East Coast." Ew. Isn't that weird? Ruby on Rails is a lot of fun. So I was like, "No, thank you." Yeah. <laughs> I was like, "Okay." So then That's you fun. ended up with me. How lucky. I had the opposite where they told me I should be in this one so I could do Python. I was supposed to be in a Ruby one at first. What the hell? Nobody told me <laughs> anything. <laughs> no, I... that Ruby on Rails thing is just, that seems like just a GA thing where it's like East I... Coast, West Coast. I, I don't know if that's I... legit. Well, he was like, do research in job and then I'll get back to you the next day. And I did. And I was like, I don't see it at all. <laughs> Ruby so is old as hell. It's cool, but it's old as hell. Like, it, screw yeah, that. It was, I don't know. I really like Dave, the admissions guy. He helped me out a lot. He was awesome. Dave, the admissions guy. Yeah, I was or whatever do part he is. I don't know his title. I, I was going to do part time. They recommended I do full time. They were like, it's better for you. Yeah. Yeah, I quit, I quit my job. I, I would always recommend full time. All right. Shall we do this? Let's build an express app. So um, your task was to complete this you do section up here. Um, so first we needed to go into our SEI directory into lectures. And uh, I was going to go and build out our application using our EGen replacement template. So in here, I'm going to bring that over and we're going to clone. Of course, I have done this incorrectly. Gotta call it the right thing. Uh, so we wanted to call this puppies API. So once we are in here, uh, we wanted to remove the existing Git directory. When do we remove an existing Git directory and when do we not remove an existing Git directory? This is something um, that a lot of you have struggled with. Let's talk about this a little bit since we're all here. When we clone, or so since let's say when we clone a repository or when we're trying to set up an upstream or like you're trying to remove a main repository to create your own repository. Um, okay, I'll kind of take that. What What is the main purpose behind removing this Git directory? You're I detaching guess. from the eGen replacement file. And exactly, 100%. So right now, whenever I go in here, if I was to push this up to my own GitHub, I would have all of the previous commits on our eGen replacement in here. So you would all have these last six commits that I have on this project uh, in your uh, in your own projects. You would also, if we come in here, see that if we do git remote dash V, you have this uh, SEI remote eGen replacement as the origin here, right? So 
by removing this dot git directory, what we're doing is detaching from this remote. So this will be gone after we uh, get rid of this uh, dot git directory. And we're also detaching ourselves from this previous commit history. So right now on this repo on my local machine, there's six past commits on here. Uh, what I wanna do is not have those because you all don't want commits from our work on there. So we're going to get rid of this .git directory. So you'll see now this is not initialized as a Git repo. We've lost our Git main signifier here and we're going to initialize this as a new Git repository. So we're going to get init and we're going to do a quick Git add, add all of our items in here to be tracked. And then I'm going to set our upstream. So we're going to get remote add upstream as this address. And now, um, I think you put N instead of M. Renote instead of Renote. Uh, in S E I dash. I M O T E. That should be right. Oh, I don't know why it's showing. Maybe it doesn't fire. It's showing N. Oh. So now if I do our get remote dash V again, you can see that this is now going to be the upstream. Before I added this as an upstream, there would have been nothing when I ran this command, this get remote dash V, because I came in and I deleted our uh, local get repo. Again, the commands to sync up during the lecture are right here. I'll go ahead and push up right now. Uh, all right. That's not right. Very good. All right. So um, we also need to come in and install our NPM packages. Uh, yes, Benjamin. Oh, I was just wondering how, how do you have the shortcuts where you just write G? Uh, yeah, so you can always, you should be able to already write uh, G. Um, and then I have, I'm kind of surprised this hasn't come up, come up before, but it definitely has not. Um, in my uh, Git config, this is mildly sidetracky, but I'm okay to talk about this. Um, cool. So here in my dot git config, so this lives in your root directory. Uh, so this is just in tilde slash and then dot git config. Uh, I have these aliases in here. Uh, and this allows you to uh, come in and instead of having to type out git add space dot, you can just do a. So this is something fun. I'll send this to you all, because why not? So is that part of your VS code? So you have it for every project? Uh, this is getting loaded into the command line. So this is actually happening in Git itself. Uh, so pretty much everywhere where you would use Git, you have access to these aliases. It's pretty fun and handy. Like I said, I'll send that to you if you would like to have that in your Git config. And you can add all kinds of stuff in here, so. Um, I can send you all a link about that too, as well. So you can set up your own aliases. It's a lot of fun. All right, uh, so anyway, with that out of the way, um, let's go ahead, let's open this in VS Code. All right, and now that we're in here, we can go ahead and do an NPMI. That's going to, someone tell me what that does. What does NPMI do for us? 
installing all the depend dependencies. Cool. Where are those dependencies located? In your uh, uh, yep. Yes, yes. So npmi gets all these dependencies for us from uh, npm. All right, so that's going to give us these things. We're going to need to add on a couple things here. You'll notice that we don't have anything like uh, Mongoose. We don't have our .env or any of that in here. So we will have to go in and add those things. Uh, but we'll come back to that in a second. Uh, actually, let's swing this over here. Perfect. All right, so uh, next, we're deleting our views directory because Guess what? We don't have any views. So farewell views directory. It's been fun, but we don't need that anymore. And then we are going to create a config slash database.js module. Uh, you'll notice we don't have one of those yet. So we're going to make a directory config and we're going to touch config slash database. Wow, hello. Config slash database.js. And now in here, I'm going to write out my database config. So in here, I'm going to start out. And what am I going to need? We need to install Mongoose. Yes, exactly right. I need to install Mongoose. So that's going to be an MPMI Mongoose. With that installed, I then can import it. So now I have Mongoose. And I'm going to make that uh, shortcut over to our Mongoose connection. And then I'm going to connect to a database. But what database am I going to connect to? I'm going to do process.env and then .database URL. But I sure haven't actually done any of this work yet, have I? I haven't made a .env with a database URL in it. So that's going to be the next thing I need. So that's going to be a touch for a .env file. And then I'm going to use this connection string that's right here. I'll send this in Slack for you too. You all can use this if you want, or you can use your own. Whatever you use though, should have this database URL equals blah, 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 blah. should look somewhat like this, sort of. Again, this should all be on a single line. Notice that there's only a one here. So you don't want to hit enter or anything in here. All of that's on one line. All right. So that's our uh, database set up. Uh, now what we need to do is listen for a connection event. So eb.on, and we're going to say when we're connected. And what do we want to do when we're connected? Well, we're going to have this function. And I just want a console log here. Saying that we are connected to Mongo DB. Again, if you just copied this over from an old project, that is 100% fine. We didn't really write this a whole lot, uh, even whenever we were in this unit, but hey, I figure we'll take it slow. If y'all have any questions, make sure you're asking them as we're going through this. All right, so this is going to tell us essentially where we are connected. Let's just say you've connected to the database name that we're using, which should be right here, puppies. And it's going to say the host name and then the port that we are connected on there. So whenever I run this server right now, 
what I should see here is nothing. Why do I not see a connection event? You did not install .env. Good, good. What else did I not do? You don't have views. You didn't connect the database to the server. Yes, 100%. Uh, the views are, I, I don't need any of the views because we don't have an actual, we won't be using the view engine here. So because that we got rid of that views directory earlier, React is going to serve all of our views instead. So uh, what we need to do is hook all this up now. We've created our config database.js. We've created our .env. But now what we need to do is make all these things work. So the first thing I'm going to do is do an npmi for .env. And then back in my server.js, I'm going to make use of this .env file. So I'm going to import it at the very top before I do anything else. I'm going to import .env slash config.js. That's going to make use of that .env file that we created. And then we're going to import our database. So I'm going to import .config slash database.js. Yes, Ryan. This is kind of a, I wouldn't call it a dumb question, but it's, it should have been asked, you know, in week two. Um, yeah. So in some cases we have, like when, when something takes open parentheses as like parameters or, you know, in when we're doing React, there's the, the return has them empty parentheses. It, are there times when it needs to be, there can't be a space between the statement or the, the command and the parentheses or their time, or does it not matter ever? Like, like here, are you like, asking on line, like line nine here? Like on line nine, there's no space after import, or, yep. but like down on line 21 path dot join, there's also no space. There's also no space there. Um, but like functions, sometimes the parentheses, there's a space after, or the return statements in react, there's a space sometimes like is, does it matter ever? Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so this is technically you can put a space here, but you shouldn't. Uh, what we're doing is like whenever we're calling app.set, we're invoking the set method on app, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a this is like a function call that's happening here, right? right. Um, this is that same thing that's happening here on line nine. This is instead of just this like import keyword right here, this is an actual like, this is a function instead that we're running here. Um, so whenever an we're- example of another thing. So on, uh, for the catch 404 error, which on minus 39, it should be around there on yours. Like after the app.use function, there's a space after, before rec res next, you know? I, I'm asking, like, is it ever a case where it like really matters that there is a space or there is not a space? Not so like, I, yeah, not while like it's JavaScript is going to protect you in that sense. Like, it's going to be pretty white space agnostic. It's going to compile and throw everything on a single line, and it's going to bring all these things together and all that. It's For just bad code. Clarity, right? Exactly. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Cool. Um, to your point about like returns and express though, um, that's not like a function call that you're making there. You're not calling a return function. You're just saying, I would like to return these things that I have inside of this parentheses. So, okay, so best practice is if we're, when we're calling a function, don't know space, otherwise exactly. space is fine. Got it. Yep. All right. Uh, so uh, that's our database. Uh, all set up now. Uh, so this should now, if I run NodeMon, remember that's how you run these applications, what you should see is this right here. You're connected to MongoDB, blah, 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 blah. In your case, it should say puppies. Uh, and then this part might be a little bit different. This is just our host name and the port. But you should be, at this point, if you're following along with me, connected to a database.
All right. Our next next task is to create a schema and a model named Puppy. So I don't have a models directory. Let me go create that real quick. I don't think I'm connected. My app is crashing. Your app is crashing. Have you done further steps past what we've done as a group? No. No. Okay, cool. Let me see your screen. Well, I mean, I did in my other one, but I'm running this again with you along with Okay. The, yeah, okay. You. Cool, cool. Yeah, let's so see. I did, it, I did it with um, Ryan and everyone in my group, but I just wanted to follow along with you. Um, honestly, it was because I didn't name it Puppies last time. And I was like, oh, I'll do it this time. All right. Uh, could you scroll up for me? That's it. Uh, in your sorry, in your terminal. Oh, in my terminal. Yes. Uh, your oh, NVS code terminal. Yep, 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 yep. Uh. Ah. Um. Oh no, that's right. Scroll. Sorry. Scroll down for me. Ah, uh, could I see your database.js? Um, you should not have line, uh, well, really anything after the comma in line five. Uh, towards the end of line five, you have the comma, and then you're opening an object there. You should not have any of any that. Any of it. Yep. All right. I think that was what I pasted from... from uh, flights ah gotcha uh kill that other comma too and then you just need a closing parentheses here and now this should work cool. hey look at that beautiful all right awesome thank you so much of course all right We're following along closely that's totally cool over here love it so um oh yes we are creating a models directory so i want to make a directory called models and now in this directory um oh i have to computer has to work. That would be cool. All right. So now I have a models directory and I need to touch a file called what? Puppy singular dot JS. Puppy singular. Yes, because this is a model. So this file should be called puppy dot JS. And in here, I'm going to, uh, again, import mongoose from mongoose and then i'm going to create my uh, schema keyword in here by attaching that to mongoose.schema and then I'm going to create a puppy schema. So our puppy schema is going to be a new schema. Again, this is invoked. I'm going to pass in an object. And what are my specs on this? I'm supposed to have a name, a breed, and an age. So my name is going to be a string and it's going to be required. And then I'm going to have a uh, breed with it that is also a string. It's going to default to the string mixed. And then age is going to be a number and it's going to default to the number zero. So I'm just say name. And the type on this is going to be string. and required. 
is going to be true. I'm also going to have a breed. Uh, the type on this is again going to be a string. And this is going to have a default of the string mixed. Finally, I have an age. It's going to be a number. And we're defaulting to the number zero. So that's our schema. Now I need to export a this compiled schema into a model. So I'm going to say const puppy. And then I'm going to call it mongoose.model. Model is going to be called puppy. And it's going to make use of the puppy schema. And then I can export puppy. So that is our model. Anybody have any questions about this? Very good. So all of our puppies are going to follow this structure that we've got here. Now what we need is going to be routes. So uh, let's look at our instructions here. Uh, so we are going to namespace our API uh, routes and code. Uh, so we're going to do that by throwing all of this in slash API slash puppies. So this is going to be the route that we mount in our server.js. And we're going to start by renaming our generated routes slash users.js. We're going to kind of just hijack this file and have it be puppies instead. So I'm going to rename this file so that is going to hold all of our routes for our puppies API. And we're going to get rid of this existing index.js. Uh, if your server's running, you should have errors firing off right about now because we haven't completed all this work. Uh, we need to wrap up in server.js. So in here, we don't have this index router anymore at all. It can go away. And we don't have a user's router. We have a puppies router. That we're getting on routes slash puppies.js. So that is our new router. That's taking the place of our user router. And then we also need to change up our mounted routes. Again, we don't have an index router anymore, so we get rid of that. And our base path for this is going to be slash API slash puppies. That's the root of all of the routes that we're going to make. So this is going to live on slash API slash puppies. Because we're going to be exposing this API to our front end. And this isn't going to use the user's router. It's going to use the puppies router. All right. That is all of our route work done. So as part of building out our API, yeah, oh yeah, Seb. You're muted, Seb. Sorry, uh, I don't think I fully understand like where the directory or like API is coming from. Cause I just realized I was, I had already gone ahead in this step and I realized that everywhere I was supposed to have written API slash puppies, I just wrote slash puppies. 
and I'm looking in your um, explorer and I don't see like a bigger directory called API, is that just implicit that we're working in the directory API? Yes, totally. That is what's going on here. Um, if you wanted to be a little bit more explicit, you could. All that we're going to be building out now in these backend applications are going to be APIs though. Um, that is what we're building out here. So you, while you could do that, it's just going to be implied because we're going to say all of our uh, resources now live behind this slash API slash whatever route. Um, that's just going to be what we assume going into this. So then we'll also be making routes for the API specifically, or am I just losing? No, we will not. Uh, the, we're only going to have routes for the resources. This slash API is here to essentially differentiate these uh, these backend routes from our front end route. Um, because what is what you'll see is these will actually be running eventually whenever we deploy up to Heroku on the same server at the same time. So if you had a uh, if you had a application that was using puppies like in the front end, and your code there lives on your application slash puppies, that would be a, a conflict with this route if we didn't have slash API here. Uh, so that's why we have to make this distinction. That's why we're kind of declaring this here and now is like this is our API. Therefore, we're going to put it inside of the slash API route. Uh, really good question. Any other questions before we move on? Yeah, Ali. Um, I don't have app.set for both the view engine EGS and the path.join. I don't have both those app.set. I think me and the team that I was working, we got a little bit ahead. But yeah, do we totally. need to add that now? You should not have that actually. Because okay, I was wondering, yeah. Okay. Because we don't have views. So there's no need for a view engine. There's no need for a views directory. We don't need any of that. So cool. Just making sure. Thank you. Totally, yeah. All right. So um oh yeah, we're one. Can you push your code to make sure yeah, that I have the same thing? This is a fantastic time to push code. This is where you all should have left off with one another in your groups. So um, again, yeah, this is a great time to push up um, and pull my code if you need it. Very good. So uh, let's talk about response codes next. Uh, so all of our APIs that we expose are going to respond with JSON. Uh, they're going to send JSON data uh, both to the server and from the server. Uh, so because we are designing a well-built API, we're also going to send a status code alongside our uh, are alongside that actual JSON data, uh, because we're going to be able to make decisions on the front end based off of uh, those status codes. And also that's going to help us with error handling as well, uh, having these proper response codes in place. So like you've almost assuredly gone to a website before and gotten back a 404 error. Um, whenever we have something like that in React, uh, that's because we're sending that status code. That's because we can fall back and say, does this resource exist on our backend? If it doesn't, I want to respond from the backend with a 404 error because we're requesting the wrong thing. Um, so that is something that's going to be really, really handy for us back on the front end. So we want to start with that now on the back end. So uh, here you can see the common resource uh, response codes that we will be using. You can also see that this links out to the HTTP status codes, which I will link up. Uh, so 
whenever you have these uh, status codes here, that's going to be super, super handy for you. Uh, again, these are just like all of the common ones that exist. Uh, so we won't necessarily be using a whole lot of these, but these are available to you uh, should you need them. You see, hey, we have a redirection here. Uh, and then we have all of our client errors. What can our clients do wrong? Uh, and then we have server errors, like what can our servers do wrong? Uh, what we want to be saying most of the time is going to be success. Uh, so that is usually what we will hopefully be responding with is one of these success messages. All right, so one of those that you'll note, though, is a server error down here. These are all of the things that can go wrong with our server. Uh, so we want to kind of have like a fallback default that we can use uh, for our server errors. Uh, that is going to be this 500 error that we have here, this internal server error. Uh, and we're doing that again so that we have this information available to us on the front end, on our React application side. Uh, so that we can say, hey, was there a 500 uh, status sent back along our with our JSON error. Uh, if there was, then I want to actually have some kind of error message related to that. So this error handler is actually going to replace the existing error handler because something that this does, you'll see, is it renders a error page. It renders, it's looking for a view called error. Again, we don't have views here, so we can't use this, and we need something else instead. That's what this is going to get us. So we are going to essentially replace most of this with, instead of an error page, a status and a message and we're not rendering we're just sending the data because again there's no views here there's nothing to far back into render that's the job of the front end now so we're responding with whatever our uh, status code is for our error or by default just the generic 500 error we're also attaching an object with error and then the error message. All right. So how do we actually handle this on our in our controller functions well they're going to look like this now this is a really simple index function that we're going to be running here uh, this is in the three different ways that, we, that we've learned about doing this you're free at this point to choose whatever your heart desires you know about all of these you're able to write all of these i will be using dot thens on the back end uh, so that is what you can expect to see from me. Uh, but all of these would be valid. You can use async await with uh, try and catch. You can also use this basic callback function. Uh, I will say whenever you're doing your unit project, make sure that you're using the same thing. The important part of this is that you're consistent. Uh, if you're using dot thens, in your back end, then you're going to want to stick with using dot then and dot catch in your back end. If you're using a single weight in your back end, then you're going to want to be using that throughout all of your back end. Again, I don't necessarily care what you're using. It's that you're using something consistently. Even if you have different people programming your back end, you need to talk about this up front and be like, hey, how are we coding our back end? Are we using dot then? Are we using async await? Um, it might be good to, you'll probably more than likely be using async await up on the front end. 
Uh, so if you want all of your code consistent across your front end and your back end, it would probably make sense to use, you know, this async await so that you're all kind of able to speak the same language so that you're all kind of synced up with one another. You can realistically do whatever. But like I said, the most important thing about this is that you remain consistent. Uh, I also probably wouldn't necessarily use a callback function. Um, like, sure, they work, um, but I would prefer to see code that sticks to dot then and dot catch and also async await with try catch blocks. Because you're both at that, or you're, you're, you're all at one of those levels. So, um, yeah, and callback function, it, it it's fine. It works, but, you know, like I said, this uh promise based structure works really really well and keeps you out of callback hell so um that is going to be uh how we are going to write these and in here you'll see that we have this res dot status and then we're sending inside of that status the actual status code that we want to send so this is a 200 and that is going to mean if we refer back over here to our HTTP status codes, that's going to say, okay. And it just lost my place. That's okay. All right. So after that status code, you'll see that we are also sending json data by chaining on dot json and then whatever resource that we want to send back to our front end in this case that's going to be puppies because what we've done is puppy dot find that got us all of the puppies which we are then sending back to the front end we're doing res and then we're sending a status code of 200 along with the data that's what this is doing it's sending the status code and the JSON data. All right. So let's actually write some code. Um, we are going to start with puppies create. Uh, because we don't have any puppies in our database yet, it would make sense for us to be able to create some. So we can use the five-step process for this. Um, there's going to be a couple minor, minor issues with this though. You'll see here in step two, we don't have a UI. There is no view to create. Uh, so we're going to be pretty much using this five-step process, but we'll be skipping step two. Also, if you scroll down to step five here, you're going to see, again, we don't have any views. There's no views to render. So all we're doing is responding with a status code and the JSON, whether that is an error or whether it's the actual resource that the user requested. So let's do that. So we are going to create a, a new controller. So now you have a controllers directory. And we're going to, in that directory, touch puppies.js. So in our router file, we can now link up these routes that we're going to write to controllers. To do that, we need to actually import those controllers. So we are going to import star as puppies control from uh, slash controllers slash puppies. Don't forget, you do need to write the .js here. Um, that is something that you have hopefully not fallen entirely out of the habit of since uh, React will handle this for you. Remember, your back end is not going to handle this process for you. So you need to be writing that .js whenever you're writing code in the back end. All right. 
So we now have our uh, controller functions available to us in our router. And we can now actually write our controller or our, yeah, our controller. So in here, at the top of every controller, we're always importing the model specific to that controller. So we're going to import puppy to get our puppy model from uh, slash models slash puppy dot JS. Don't forget that dot JS. All right. So with that out of the way, we can now write our index controller function. So I'm going to stop up a function called index. Again, this takes in rec, it takes in res. Request response. And hey, this is a great time to do a quick little sanity check. Let's make sure that all this stuff works. So this is going to be a console log. This is not an index function. This is a create function. Whoops, because we're creating puppies. Sorry about that. So again, just gonna stub this up for now, real simple. And then we're going to make sure that we are exporting this function. So I'm going to export create. That's our controller function written. Now we just need to make use of this controller function back in our route. So this is not going to get users. This is going to get puppy or not even get, this is going to create puppies. And this is going to be happening on localhost thousand slash API slash puppies. And this is going to be a post. How do I change this from a get request to a post request on that route? Anybody remember? Router dot post. Yes, exactly. Router dot post. It Again, seems this... so obvious, but it seems wrong. <laughs> yeah, this isn't Django. Uh, Django is handling all of this stuff for you, but now we're back in Express land where we have to tell Express exactly what we want. So this is going to be router.post. And remember, our root route on this is slash API slash puppies. That's what we mounted over here in server.js. We have slash API slash puppies. So any route that hits this file is going to live at localhost 8000 slash API slash puppies. Any route in here is going to live here. This is going to be a post request to this route, which is exactly what I want. Again, we kind of already conceptualized all of the routes up here. We have full CRUD in this application. Uh, so this is going to be a post request to slash API slash puppies to actually add a puppy. And that's what we've written here. So now that we have this, we can do puppies controller dot create. Now, any requests that we have, any post requests that we have on localhost 3000 slash API slash puppies 
is going to call upon our puppies control dot create controller function. Again, this is stuff that you've done before, but it's been a little bit. Do y'all have any questions about this kind of framework that we've set up so far? Seb is violently shaking his head now. <laughs> What'd you say, Kate? I was just saying this is nice review. Thank you. Yeah, of course. That's what this is for. It's really good. And I, I feel like it's making, I, I know that like the more we do stuff, the more it'll make sense. But I feel like things that I was a little fuzzy about the last time are like, oh, like clicking into place. And I feel like- Yes. Yes. Nice. That's exactly what you want. So uh, that, that like wild point there, um, that is like what you can expect whenever you're going back and reviewing stuff now. Um, that like, I promise you, even if you are shaky back in unit two on this stuff, you're going to come to this and be like, oh, that's how we write this. Why was I so confused about that in unit two? Like that we like just giving your brain space away from doing that is like created this like weird connection sphere in your mind where you're like, oh, this actually like makes sense and works. And like, even though I haven't seen any of this code in three weeks, like here we are and this stuff is clicking into place again. So that's kind of how you should be feeling as you're going through this. If that's not where you are, that's okay. Like I, I came around to a lot of your groups and was saying, some of this will take a little bit more time to kind of click back in. But um, like I said, the stuff that we've done so far is pretty much review. So uh, Ali. Um, can you show us where both frameworks are like going to be connected or connected? Because you know how we skip. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> I was we will, we will. Don't worry. We will get there. <laughs> uh, Abdul. Um. Uh, should I be getting a 404 error when I run the server? Uh, when you're running the server? Yeah. Let's see what we get. Now's a great time to run our server. You should not be getting a 404 error, though. What oh. are you trying to do exactly? What, uh, well, I was trying to see the console log that we have. Oh, I we'll, we'll get we'll get there in a second. Oh, we Don't worry. Yep, 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 yep. That's, yeah, that's why I was asking where we where it was connecting because yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We'll we'll like two seconds. We'll get there, Jared. Um, I'm still a little confused in building our routes here. The slash with router dot post, mm -hmm. but we have the slash API slash puppies in server JS. Yes. Yep. That so, is just saying I want you to use this route, like this root route that we have. This API, is, so this is all going to be on localhost 3000 slash API slash puppies. So say if I was to, like, this is a totally nonsensical route, so don't create this. Uh, but if I wanted to have a post on puppies slash uh, toys, for some reason, again, don't actually write this, this would be slash toys right here. Ah, I'm so sorry. I'm turned around. That slash or slash toys is coming at the end of API. Yes. Puppies. Yep. yep. So yep, the yep. is just closing it up with a slash at the end. Exactly. Yep. Yep. I will stop being turned around by that in like two No, you're, that's totally cool because that is the exact opposite of how Django works. So it would be natural for you to be like, oh, this is different. So it's a good realization to have right now that like, oh, this is how we write this again. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, totally. All right. So uh, next up, let's actually talk to this. I know I'm going into your lunch. Sorry, I'll give you a longer lunch. Don't worry. Um, but I do want us to at least have one small victory before we go. Uh, so you're going to want to pull up Postman. And that is how we're going to interact with this API today. Again, tomorrow we'll actually throw in like, hey, here is, uh, you know, some cool, fun stuff that we can do up to connect our front end to our back end using an actual React application. But for today, we are simply going to be uh, doing this from uh, Postman. And this is going to essentially emulate exactly what our React front end is going to be getting from the back end, though. Uh, I'm going to 
make sure you're not updating right now. It'll take a little bit. So what we want to do is first ensure that your server is running and does not have any errors. And then we're going to come over here. Um, I'm going to save this. So in Postman, this is kind of what you should see from the last time we were here. Uh, so here you're going to want to make a new tab. And then you're going to change this from a get request to a post request. So make sure that this says post right here. And our request URL is going to match this right here. It's going to be HTTP colon slash slash localhost colon 3000 slash API slash puppies. Whenever we do hook up our front end to our back end, this is what that request is going to look like that our front end is making to our back end. We're just doing it here in Postman for now. So this is going to be the actual URL you're calling. And then in here, we want to go into body because remember we're creating a resource. So we need to be sending data with this request. And we're going to use this x dash www dash form dash url encoded again that's right here in this little drop down and you should now see a table that looks like this you should have key value and description here remember we are in here in body and then we click this drop down x dash www dash form dash URL encoded. What should be our keys here? We're creating a puppy. What do we need? How can uh, we tell? Name, name, breed, and age. Perfect. Why do we need those? That's what's in that's our model. What's in our model. Yes, that's what's in your model. Your model is your source of truth. So we need a name. We need a breed. We need an age. Our name needs to be a string. Our breed needs to be a string. Our age needs to be a number. We don't necessarily need to send a breed or an age, but we must send a name. I'm going to go ahead and send all of these. So I'm sending a name, I'm sending a breed, and I'm sending an age. Now, whenever I do this, if everything goes well, if I have a post request up here to HTTP colon slash slash localhost colon 3000 slash API slash puppies, and I send a name, a breed, and an age, in my response, I should get JSON back. And that JSON should look like a MongoDB document. Let's try it. That's we've not right all, at all. Why am I all, saying any of that? All we should see is a console log. <laughs> we haven't done that yet. All we should see is a console log in our uh, <laughs> in the uh, terminal for your app. One day soon, we'll see an actual puppy. <laughs> so what you should see now, though, is a console log that says we're creating puppies. Um, anybody have any questions? Anybody not getting that console log? I'm not, but I also have gone, our group have gone slightly ahead, so. Okay, okay, cool. Um, how about we stop there for lunch then? Um, and I'll troubleshoot your issues, Seb. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, how about I'll give you all I stole eight minutes from you, so I'll give you something back. Be here fifteen after, so you have an hour and seven minutes for lunch. Enjoy it, and we'll actually make puppies. Can you push your code, David? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, Seb, your issue. Can I just pull your code and just start where you guys are at? Or? I am one hundred percent fine to do what whatever you want. I will investigate your issue all day long, or you can just pull my code. To, I'm done to investigate. Okay, cool. Let's check it out. So this is what I was messaging you about. So I, I was kind of in clear where we have things like controller api.js. Do we need a controller for the API? Uh, no, you do not. So that's just meant to be api slash puppies.js. Uh, yes, it is. Yep. OK, so I can kill this. And then I can bring. Okay. Yeah, so there's that. And then I made an API. So we also don't need an API routes. Correct. This is, yes. This is going to be API slash puppies.js. Yep. So I just confused myself. Now you're cool. I need to look at that. That's kind of awkward. No, this can work Uh, why are you not? Okay. Should I just try seeing what my server looks like, Google? Um. Yeah, let's let's try this now. Um, like in Postman or? Yeah, in Postman. Just send this. Uh, what the hell is it about? Uh, you have HHTP. It should be HTTP. HTTP. If that was the problem. Okay, no, that was the problem. That was not the problem. Uh, oh, flashing? colon slash slash. Colon slash slash. Cool. Yeah. Hey, you're made a puppy. Good job. So Sweet. happy for you. Should we be getting the um in the terminal if we get if we went ahead and did the create function in the in the console? Should we be getting like fail to load resource? No, you okay. should be getting the resource response in Postman. Uh, kind of. I don't know if you saw what Seb just did. Yeah, I got the in Postman. I got. I got it. Okay. everything in Postman works fine, but in the okay. console, in um, the browser console, I'm getting nothing. Oh, yeah, you won't have anything in the browser console. Okay, at all. just want to make sure of that. Yep. Ali. I'm getting the same thing Seb is getting. Well, okay, yeah. cool. Let's check it out. Um, so when I send the request, nothing happens. Um. That should be working. Why? Could you restart your server for me? Yes. And try again. Okay. Could I see your server.js? Yes. Just need to go puppy. Um, interesting connection refused. Why? I don't have a console log, but I have the function written down like finished. 
Okay. Could you? No, that should work. Um, could you go to bin. B I N. Yep, and then yep, that file. Uh, scroll down for me, just a little bit. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. You should be getting a console. Kill your server one more time for me. Sorry. You got it. No, of course. Uh, and run node mod again. Why are you not getting interesting? I'm the create way. Okay. Can I see your server.js again? Yes. Um, scroll up for me. Okay, that looks right. Weird. Um, Does the dot env have anything to do with this? Uh, no, it wouldn't. Yes. 